Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to Marginal Structural Models. My name is Anne Greenwood. I'm the Education and Training Lead for Population Data BC, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Rosella, who will be our presenter for today. By way of introduction, Dr. Rosella is an epidemiologist and associate professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, where she holds a Canadian Research Chair in Population Health Analytics. She is the Site Director for ICES. University of Toronto and faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. In 2020, she was made the inaugural Stephen Family Research Chair in Community Health at the Institute for Better Health Trillium Health Partners. She leads the Population Health Analytics Lab at the Dalai Lama School of Popu Public Health. Uh, which is focused on using population databases to inform population health and health system planning. So thank you very much for being our presenter today. Uh, Dr. Rial, I really appreciate your time and uh, ability to share with our, our audience today. Thank you everyone for attending and I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Rosella. Thank you so much for that great introduction and for having me and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone uh, you're in to everybody attending today. Um, I don't know where, where I, in my area of Canada, it's spring, it's April 21st, but it's snowing. So it's kind of a, an unusual day. Hopefully uh, your day is going better. So today I'm going to talk about uh, exactly what the slide says, introduction to marginal structural models. And this is meant to be an introductory lecture. Uh, there's lots of deep technical uh, points that could be discussed. Uh, this lecture is really meant to get a strong conceptual understanding uh, of these models and how they might be useful in particular in large population uh, data sets. So the format for today, we're going to talk about, uh, again, what are marginal structural models? Why do you need to know about them if you do large uh, population health data analysis? We're going to focus on the conceptual understanding of these models, and I'm going to really try and relate them to other approaches that you're much more familiar with, uh, that are more common, um, and why you might want to use these methods. It's really important to understand when you're thinking about new methods or thinking about new approaches that you understand the context to which they fit in. Uh, it doesn't mean that every problem now needs a marginal structural solution, but for some of the problems that uh, you may face when analyzing big data, it might be very helpful, and we'll talk about why. So we're going to understand the appropriate applications, perhaps the inappropriate, and really think through the interpretation differences uh, through some examples. And at the end, I'll provide some further resources and direction for code or uh, other papers, which you may want to dig into if you'd like to pursue these methods further. So... First and foremost, what are these models? And the first thing I want to really emphasize is that uh, marginal structural models is not a model. It's actually a multi-step estimation process. And so sometimes when we call it a model, it can feel a little misleading, at least to me. And when we say multi-step, what we mean is you're separating the confounder control from the model estimation piece for the effect of interest. The process involves calculating weights, and you would run a particular model uh, using these weights once they're generated. And I'll talk much more in detail about all these things. When would you use them? Again, high level, we're gonna go into more detail about this. Most commonly you apply these methods, at least in our context, in large uh, observational health data analysis for uh, the purpose of causal inference when using observational data. And in particular, when you wanna control for time varying confounding. And in health administrative data, if that's an area of, of interest of yours, and even in uh, cohort studies and panel studies, what you have is information on your exposure and outcome, but also confounders, and those can change over time. And the way we handle the way they change over time can introduce bias. So that's what we're trying to address with these approaches. They also have utility for causal mediation analysis, which is an analysis specifically aimed at estimating direct and indirect effects of mediators in causal questions. And I'll mention that one briefly at the end, but that won't be the focus of today's uh, lecture. 
So a couple of fun facts. Uh, structural uh, is the econometric term uh, generally for causal. And so there's a little bit of terminology here. So if you kind of made a substitution, marginal causal models, that might make it a bit more intuitive what these models actually are for. I'm going to talk a lot about inverse probability of treatment weighting as one of the ways to execute those weights I'm talking about in this multi-estimation procedure. Um, and you might hear a lot of familiar terminology, and some of you might be well-versed in propensity methods. And they are closely related, but actually emerge somewhat independently when you look at the evolution of these methods. And uh, so we're in a place now where we see all these methods working together. They're complementary, some different approaches to achieve the same technique. We actually have a little bit of a different history in terms of how these have evolved, just for a little bit of context before we start digging in. So the first uh, part of this talk is really focusing on the fundamental concepts. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is if you understand these pieces, which I'm going to go through, the marginal structural piece uh, it should be relatively straightforward. Of course, you know, always easier said than done. You have to get the data and work through the problems technically, but really uh, understanding when and why you want to use much marginal structural models really comes with understanding these elements, which I'm going to go through uh, in detail. So let's start with conditional versus marginal. So this is a framework for generalized linear models and generalized linear models are what we use extensively in uh, population health uh, research. So we might use uh, a binary outcome or a count outcome. We might assume distributions, binary and count distributions um, because we're looking for rates or whether an outcome happened, yes or no. We might use binomial distributions and Poisson or negative binomial distributions. We assume link functions like log links or logit links in the case of uh, logistic regression. And then we have this really handy framework that works with lots of different types of distributional assumptions and helps us estimate an effective interest, be it a relative risk, odds ratio, has, uh, hazard ratio would be survival analysis, uh, but relative risk, relative rate, for example. And we can adjust for other factors in our model. Right. So this is what many people are very familiar with, widely used, uh, very flexible and robust to lots of situations. So the key thing here is understanding that these approaches that we use widely are conditional effects. For example, we're estimating the effect of an exposure, let's say it's beta one in this case, conditional on all the other things in the model. And we do that because we want to adjust uh, out all of the other factors in the model to create an adjusted effect. But for marginal structure models, we don't estimate conditional effects, we estimate marginal effects. And this is a really important uh, understanding in terms of the inter interpretation and also some of the benefits and flexibility of marginal approaches. So as I mentioned, conditional approaches estimate effects conditional on other variables in the model. And again, we can use lots of different regression frameworks, not just GLM, as I mentioned, to do this. And so you would get sort of the effect of an exposure, say a drug conditional on all the covariates in the model. A marginal approach, however, uses the marginal distributions of the exposure. And so what that means is you'd wanna look at what the overall um, effect is Balanced on, the uh, uh, balanced on the confounders over the level of the exposure. So, so let's say you had a drug and no drug, there would be balance on all the other things that differed between those groups, and you'd estimate an overall, let's say, rate of an outcome or whether an event happened, yes or no, or in the case of survival modeling, uh, time to event. So it's not a conditional estimate, from that estimate, you can generate whatever effect you're interested in. It's not conditional on other, all the other factors in the model. We achieve confounding control by balancing the confounders through the two groups and in, a, in the case of a binary exposure. And we'll talk about how we actually achieve that in a bit more detail. But really important just to understand the difference between conditional and marginal. And so it's not simply a swap to say, well, I'm just going to do a multivariable adjusted logistic regression, and then I'm going to do a marginal uh, approach, and they give me the same estimate. They actually get interpreted slightly different, one being conditional with all things in the model being held constant, and one being marginal. So now that we've been through that piece, I'm going to spend some time talking about the potential outcomes framework. <clears throat> 
So the potential outcomes framework, uh, there's lots of names for it, originally known as Rubin's causal model when it was originally proposed, um, is defined as the potential outcome or state of affairs that would have happened in the absence of a cause. That's why it's a potential outcome. If that cause were not there or that exposure or that treatment, this is what would have potentially happened. And by looking at the, di the difference between what happened with the exposure and without the exposure, we use that to make causal interpretations. It's the framework that we apply in both randomized and non-randomized studies. And uh, I, I like to show this movie clip for those, uh, or reference to a movie for those that remember this movie. And I, you know, I realize as I'm getting older, uh, some people haven't seen this movie, but definitely as I was growing up, this was something that we watched every year, which is, um, it describes an individual who is struggling in life and sort of says, well, I wonder what would happen. If, I wish I was never born sort of statement. And then someone comes along and shows what life would have happened had he never been born. And um, there's a happy ending uh, at the end of that movie. But that sort of idea of what would the potential outcome of all those aspects of his life have been had he not been born. And in a way, it's the causal estimate of that exposure. So that's kind of what we're getting at. So let's look at it in a little more details to make it a little abstract. And this is the uh, kind of notation that we use to describe the counterfactual framework. So if yi is your outcome, we know that uh, we can summarize it this way, such that wi is one if uh, treatment is received or exposure. I'll use the terms treatment and exposure interchangeably throughout. Um, depending on your question, it's either exposure, but it also can be a treatment. And um, WI equals zero if uh, an individual does not receive a treatment and YI is the outcome. So let's work it through if they receive the treatment, do not receive the treatment and summarize this counterfactual framework, which is critical for how we're implementing our causal interpretations. So what happens if they receive the treatment? Well, uh, WI goes to one and we work through the formula and we see that our outcome is equal to Y1 for a particular individual. And if they do not receive the treatment, you simply plug in zero there and yi equals y zero uh, for a particular individual. And so why am I going through this? Why is this useful? Well, essentially that makes a lot of sense. If you receive the treatment, that's your outcome. If you don't receive the treatment, that's your outcome. But the problem is in observational data, we can't observe both these things at once. There can't be a situation where I took a drug, and you observed what happened to me, and then I didn't take a drug, and you observed what happened to me over the same time period, you can't observe both those things at once. Both cannot be true. So this is known as the fundamental problem of causal inference. So that idea that for each individual, you can only observe one potential outcome, and that's where the, the terminology potential outcome comes from. So According to the framework, the counterfactual framework that we're actually implementing here, you can estimate the counterfactual factual by taking averages. So if you take the average of those that were treated compared to the average of those that were none, not treated, this is known as the average treatment effect. I'm denoting here as tau. And that gives you an estimate of the causal uh, um, interest that your uh, causal exposure that you're interested in. And you can also extend this to average treatment effect among the treated, which is another uh, parameter, which I'm not going to go into in a lot of detail. So it seems very straightforward. How can we achieve this? Well, in randomized studies, we achieve this through the randomization mechanism. Um, and uh, in observational studies, we have to do a bit more work. And that's because there are some critical assumptions for implementing this framework. And I'm gonna focus on two. The first one being the ignorable treatment uh, assumption that has lots of different uh, terms. Um, and this basically, uh, this assumption is that the treatment is independent of the outcome conditional on X, which is other factors in the model. Essentially, this is an assumption of no uh, unmeasured confounding. And if there's no confounding at all, then we know those that were treated and untreated, we can take the average difference and that indeed is our average causal estimate. But of course, in observational data, we know that's not the case. In fact, that's what we spend 
vast majority of our time worrying about is confounding. We know that those that are treated or untreated or exposed or unsposed are different in lots of ways. And any one of those ways in which they differ could be the reason that we're observing the effect we're observing. So we simply cannot take the, the, the difference. When we use a conditional approach, what we say is, well, what about if you adjust for all those factors in the model? And then we have a conditional estimate, um, conditional on holding all these things constant. This is the effect of either a difference or a rate ratio or an odds ratio, whatever effect you're interested in. And um, that's one way to achieve it, although we know there can be problems with that. And that's our big challenge in observational study. The one challenge with multi, what I just talked about using multivariable approaches to do that is you can't actually test whether or not you've achieved balance, at least on your measured confounders. So if you adjust for 10 factors in the model that you think that are confounding and you have good conceptual basis for that, that's great. But I can't actually show you that in the exposed and the unexposed, these are balanced out in any way. I can just show that you've, you've adjusted for them. The advantages of an inverse probability treatment weight approach, which I will show you, and even some of the propensity methods, which you might be more familiar with, is that you can actually separate that part out. You demonstrate balance, and at least on the measured confounders, and then you proceed to estimation. So you separate that out in two steps. Of course, you can't assume uh, unmeasured confounding is not playing a role, and that's a, a limitation across the board. And we'll, we'll talk about that a few times. The other assumption to keep in mind is positivity, and that is there is a non-zero probability of treatment or exposure, which might seem obvious on the surface, but you have to be very careful, especially with observational data and administrative data. There can be structural issues why individuals cannot be treated. Um, maybe there are access issues or there's some dependency in the data that needs to be accounted for. So this is other, another assumption uh, that needs to be satisfied and you conceptually have to establish this first. So the potential outcomes framework, which I'm introducing here, and, and again, you might have some familiarity with it, but if not, it's really critical to understand that it provides a mechanism to allow us to account for confounding and estimate causal effects. So we're applying the potential outcomes framework, and then we'll use some methods, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail to deal with the confounding that we can measure. Um, by explicitly including a confounder balance estimate uh, step in here, which I'll talk about in the uh, IPTW uh, section, you separate the confounder control and effect estimation. So that's a big uh, advantage. Um, we always have the challenge of unmeasured confounders. I'm going to say that several times throughout the presentation. So we know the difference between conditional and marginal. These approaches use, are estimating marginal effects. We've talked about the causal, one way to think about causal questions using a potential outcomes framework. Now let's talk about inverse probability of treatment weights, which is the most common way to execute a marginal structural model approach. I will say it's not the only way. There are other ways to do it. I'm not going to cover them, um, namely the G uh, parametric G formulas or G estimation methods, but I, I wanna mention that they exist. They're uh, trying to achieve the same thing. It's just a different way of doing it. IPTWs are more common because they're fairly easy to implement and fairly robust. Um, and we'll talk about um, some things you have to watch out for when you implement them. So the IPTW really focuses on the probability of treatment, right? And again, or exposure. So if you know that you have observational data, some people are treated, some are not, and there are factors that differ between the two, you can summarize those factors in a model, let's say a logistic regression model, to predict the probability of treatment. And you can use that predicted probability to then uh, understand the differences between the two. And in the case of a propensity matched approach, you develop propensity scores, you match, and you proceed with your analysis. But in IPTW approach, you create weights. And the weights are the inverse probability of receiving treatment. So the IPTW formula is there. We're using our similar notation, W uh, being one if you receive treatment, zero if you do not or are exposed. E here summarizes your probability of being treated. You would generate that from most typically a statistical regression model like logistic regression, but uh, more often we're seeing machine learning models also being used to generate that E. Mm -hmm. 
So let's work it through again so we can kind of make it more realistic what an IPTW estimator does. And again, for uh, focusing on the average treatment effect. And we remember from our potential outcomes framework why we're interested in the average treatment effect. So here we see if treatment is zero and you plug zero into the formula here, your probability of treatment is one over one minus the probability of being treated. And if your treatment is one, it's one over the probability of being treatment treated, excuse me. So those are the weights now that we apply to our observational population. And in a marginal structural model framework, so you can do this uh, in just regular IPTW analysis, but in a marginal structural model framework, you do this repeatedly for the various time points in your data to try and uh, account for the time varying confounding. And we're going to talk about why you do that in just a few minutes. And so you apply these weights, and what we say once you've reweighted your population, you have the data that you observed. Now we apply these inverse probability of treatment weights that account for the probability of being exposed, and you create what we sometimes call a pseudo population. So, what is the pseudo population, and how can I make inferences from it? So, this pseudo population now is weighted based on those weights I just covered in the previous slide, and it no longer represents the population we observe in our data but the population that would exist under the random treatment assumption, and ideally independent of the confounders that we've put into our model. Um, we, we ensure that with whatever's in our IPTW model, that we have all the confounders at least that we can measure in here. And so it's known as a counterfactual or a pseudo population because we don't actually observe it. It's the population we've created with these weights. Um, and again, Going back to our movie, we're thinking back to this life that was shown to this this uh, man who was wondering what would happen if he didn't wasn't born. Um, it's not the life we observed, but it's a life that would have happened. And once we know that with the weights, we can actually estimate an unbiased causal estimate of the treatment because we've balanced on on the differences that we know about. So. I've t I will bring up assumptions a bunch of times um, throughout the presentation to remind us that like, this is pretty cool, right? We can generate causal estimates using observational data. Sounds very powerful, very useful, very handy. Um, we don't have to do randomized trials. We can't do randomized trials for all of these. We wanna understand how they work in real world environments. So this is all very powerful and exciting. However, we have to remember that they do rely on these really strict assumptions. And if there's a problem with these assumptions, the validity of the estimates or the causal claims that you're making will also um, potentially be compromised. So let's remind ourselves again what some of these assumptions are. And there's one specific to IPTW that I want to emphasize here that I haven't brought up yet. So I've talked the idea about the assumption of no unmeasured confounders. And um, you can't directly test it because they're unmeasured. So we can't actually say we have no unmeasured confounders because we can't observe them. We can conceptually think it through though. And this is why um, the idea of using DAGs and theory and really understanding and mapping this all out before you begin is really critical. There also um, could be challenges in your data. So there are assumptions, and this is of course, anyone that works on big, population administrative data, this is always our challenge. We don't have all the confounders we would like to have access to. So it's uh, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have to grapple with. You can do some things aside from your theory and causal graphs and logic to help understand this assumption. Um, and there's also many uh, sensitivity analyses that you can do including simulating the impact of an unmeasured confounder to see what effect it would have. Is it an important unmeasured confounder that would actually change the results in a meaningful way? Those are sensitivity analysis, they're not definitive, but done in a transparent and structured way can help you give, you, give insight into how much of a challenge you think this assumption is to your analysis. Uh, consistency is about uh, no misclassification of the exposure, and this also relates to having a really well-defined exposure. So one of the things, and I know I certainly struggle with this, is that these methods are powerful, they're really helpful, but some of the exposures I'm interested in, interested in are not well-defined. They are uh, fuzzy, if you will, or um, 
you can't think of them uh, as you would in a trial framework. You have that really clear exposure. And so that's why thinking through a target trial um, is really critical. So thinking through a target trial and what would the trial look like if I could do it is really helpful for clarifying whether you do have a well-defined exposure, you have a clear outcome, and you understand the potential confounding variables. And this is, of course, Miguel Hernan talks about this quite a bit as uh, being a very useful critical step. I'm not going into a lot of the conceptual uh, issues around setting up causal questions, but I wanted to just acknowledge uh, how important that step is. Uh, we talked about positivity already, so I won't go over that again. And then um, the, the one I want to just spend a moment on and emphasize is having a correctly specified IPTW model. So I mentioned you could use, for example, logistic regression to generate that probability of treatment from your data. But one of the big challenges is if you misspecify your model, meaning it doesn't meet the distributional assumptions or for other reasons does not fit the uh, probability of being exposed or unexposed correctly, just like we think about how models fit data in any other context, you can have biased estimates. So that's one of the risks. An incorrectly specified IPTW uh, uh, is something that could introduce bias and prevent you from making the causal estimates that you want to make. All right, so we talked about the difference between conditional marginal. We talked about the potential fr outcomes framework as a really important conceptual uh, uh, framework to help us execute and why we use it to execute causal analyses. We talked specifically about IPTWs, which are used very commonly in, in marginal structural models, and I'll show you how in the next bit. But I haven't yet told you uh, why you want to apply this. Um, and in particular, you want to apply this in the context of a, uh, where you have time varying confounding. And so I'm going to briefly cover what time varying confounding is and why it's important. So, time varying confounding, uh, in a nutshell, is kind of self explanatory if you uh, think about what, what it actually is. But essentially, I want you to think of an exposure that happens or a treatment in a particular point in time. Perhaps you're looking at drug treatment from observational data and you're looking at it again at another point in time. And maybe there are some other factors that influence that treatment that also vary over time, like um, how, what other comorbidities they have or what other medications they might have been on in the meantime. And so there, this, this is, you know, a pretty complicated topic. I, we could talk, you know, for the whole hour about all the different types of time uh, varying confounding and how... Uh, Time varying confounding can work in different ways. And here is a really great paper. If you want to um, learn more about it, just a shout out to uh, Dr. Platt, who's written out, written out all the different ways time varying confounding can actually cause um, issues. And you can uh, look it up and read more. But what you need to take away from this point is that you can have confounders that are time invariant, they're at baseline. We want to make sure we control for them for all the reasons we've talked about. And uh, that exists no matter what. But then we also have confounders that can change over time. And if we try to control for those ones that change over time, just like the ones that don't change over time, we have some issues. So what specifically are those issues and how do marginal structural models actually help? So first of all, they do not, uh, when you apply a marginal structural model frame to a problem, you don't think of confounders as fixed in time. And you don't fi fix them like we do in a conditional approach like regression. Instead, we use that weighting framework and create that pseudo cohort, which hopefully now is clear what that pseudo population means, in which all the confounders, in including those that vary over time, are balanced. So that's the critical point, right? We've talked about how using that pseudo population through weighting can create that pseudo that confounder balance, but now we have a way to actually make sure that varies over time. And so measured confounders are no longer confounders because there's no longer a relationship from C, the confounder shown in this uh, figure here, to the exposure, enabling uh, an unbiased exposure estimate. So let's just dig in just a little deeper on that. 
So here's a, a causal diagram again uh, from a really nice paper published in the BMJ by Massournia and all who have you know really really great description of what time varying compounding is and why it's an issue. It's an educational uh, paper, um, and what you have here is an exposure. Um, E0, which is a baseline exposure, and then you have E1. So that shows you it's an exposure at different points in time. Again, maybe treatment at different points in time. You have a confounder that also changes over time, and then you have an unmeasured confounder, which is U. So let's just walk through what would happen if we treated, um, we just adjusted for a confounder that was varying over time, just like we would in our typical regression. Well, the first problem is that we then adjust for a variable that's on a causal path. This is something that's changed post-exposure, post-baseline, and let's say it's a treatment and it's a blood pressure estimate that's, in, that's happened after the initial treatment. And this is sometimes known as uh, over-adjustment bias or adjusting for something on the causal path, and we know that it can bias the estimate. So that's something actually many people are aware of, um, but, and, and for that reason, often do not control for various that, uh, variables that can found over time because they don't want to uh, have that issue come up. The other problem, which is not as well known or at least discussed, is that there could be an unmeasured confounder, uh, unmeasured confounder related to the confounder. So if that confounder, again, is blood pressure and you have an unmeasured factor that's related to blood pressure and outcome, which you could think of many, when you adjust for it, so you hold it constant in, in that sense, what you end up doing is potentially opening up a path for that unmeasured confounder to bias the estimates. And this, uh, we, we know this is the case for uh, collider stratification biases, biases, which um, people might be aware of, but um, not as much, or at least I don't see it as much as the over uh, adjustment bias. So two really big challenges. So we're kind of stuck with, you definitely don't want to control for it in the traditional sense. It seems like we've con caused two, at least two problems, biases that didn't exist before. Um, and you do also don't want to just not adjust for it because it indeed is a confounder. So if we don't adjust for it, how can we make a causal uh, claim? So marginal structure models help address these concerns. And I was going to go through the assumptions again, but I think I've emphasized that enough. Let's go through some examples and see indeed how that actually happens. So this is an example, uh, again, really, I, I would say accessible paper, uh, also educational because uh, the goal of this paper is really to demonstrate uh, marginal structure models to compare uh, treatment effects for antihypertensive combination therapy, both using like sort of a traditional approach and a non-traditional approach. This is a survival um, example. So I've been talking about GLMs, but everything that I've mentioned also applies for survival models as well. So if you look at the DAG, you can see here you have a blood pressure um, at baseline, which is BP0, you have uh, 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 treatment at baseline, and then you have blood pressure one, which is again the confounder that happen that changes based on the treatment. And then based on the blood pressure, you might adjust your treatment, right? So this isn't you're sort of like a fringe situation. Clinically, this uh, you can see how this could happen quite a bit. So the key points to emphasize here is that the the treatment is continually adapted based on clinical characteristics. And this could be true for lots of observational data we observe in health administrative data and other uh, EMR data. And things, lots of things are changing over time. Blood pressure in particular in this example could be, mediate the beneficial effect of the treatment. And so if you just adjust for it, you're going to see bias. And as I was mentioning before, there's likely unmeasured confounders associated with blood pressure that if we just simply adjust for it, we're opening up the possibility of a collider stratification bias as well. So what did they actually do? So first, thinking back to what we've just been uh, covered, first things first, they estimate the inverse probability of treatment weights based on each individual individual's probability of receiving the treatment that they're interested in, which is this aggressive hypertensive treatment. So um, you estimate that E in those equations I showed you earlier at every time point. 
and then used a pooled logistic regression approach, um, which also includes blood pressure to summarize the overall weights. And you do this because you're estimating at every time point. So this is the critical difference from just doing an IPT DW for a regular causal question where you have a baseline exposure and you're looking at outcome, you can definitely do that. But here, the key point is doing it at every time point. This is where the flexibility comes in with these approaches. You could not do this with propensity matching, for example. You can't propensity match uh, at every time point. But IBTW allows uh, for a way to actually generate those weights and then combine them over time. The other thing I haven't mentioned yet is you can also generate IPCW, which are inverse probability censoring weights. And this is another key advantage. Sometimes individuals are lost to follow up for whatever reason. And the uh, probability of being lost to follow up or censored is not random, likely. There's characteristics associated with that. And you can generate a weight, a weight for who's more likely to be lost to follow up and generate what's called an inverse probability of censoring weights. And you can simply combine the IBTW weight with the IBCW weight to generate an, a final weight that accounts for both censoring and time-varying covariates. One thing I haven't talked about just yet um, is that when you generate these weights, sometimes you can get very large uh, weights or very small weights, and that can cause trouble with the estimation. And so typically when you estimate these approaches, you go through a process of stabilizing the weights or sometimes trimming the weights at you know the 1% and 99th uh, percentile. Um, so that's, I just wanted to mention that here, that's something that do, that's very typical when you're implementing IPTW approaches. And then once you do all that work to generate those weights, you use the IPTWs as weights in the regression here using a weighted Cox model because they're, they're interested in estimating a hazard ratio and you estimate the outcome, the impact of the treatment on CVD slash mortality outcomes. And for comparison, they also ran a standard time dependent approach. So I'll just pause there to again, just recap when I said at the beginning, what are marginal structure models? They're a multi-step estimation procedure. Hopefully now you see what the steps are. It involves this process of generating the weights. The reason why we generate the weights is because we're applying a potential outcomes framework and we're trying to create the pseudo population where confounders are balanced at every time point. And then once you do that, you take those weights and you estimate whatever effect you do want to estimate. And in this case, a hazard ratio. So this is, the multi uh, marginal structural model approach. So let's have a look at the outcomes. So in this particular case, again, they were comparing, I, I'm saying treated and not treated, really they're, they're comparing two treatment regimes, aggressive treatment versus the conventional treatment, which is three drugs versus two. And they have two estimates there. They have the estimate that they've generated from the marginal structural Cox model. Again, you can use Cox models, GLM models, all different types of models because you've separated the process of generating the weights in your estimation procedure. So whatever effect you're trying to estimate, you can adapt it to lots of different types of models. So here they're, they're looking for a hazard ratio and it's 0.81. So that's showing a protective effect of the more aggressive treatment and we see the confidence interval uh, 0.71 to 0.92 there. For comparison purposes, they've also ran this at, using a standard Cox model. So that would be a model where they took the treatment exposure and they adjusted for blood pressure. Now they took it one step forward with survival models. You can do time, you can adjust for time varying factors um, as well, and then you put all the other confounders in the model that you think you have. But remember that that's sort of like taking an average effect, holding time constant, uh, holding all the other factors constant. This is my conditional treatment effect. And you can see here that it's null. So you would come to quite different conclusions as the first point. Second point, be, be a little careful when you see these types of comparisons because one's a conditional estimate and one's a marginal estimate. So technically speaking, they're not exactly estimating the same thing. 
But I will say you're probably more interested from an epidemiologic and clinical perspective on the marginal one. What would happen if we treated everyone versus not treated everyone? That's the goal of uh, the estimate, the 0.81 estimate. We sometimes use conditional estimates to talk about it that way, but indeed they are conditional estimates. So we expect them to be different, but it's also a good note um, to see you come up with pretty different conclusions here. Okay, a couple more examples and we're, we're almost done. So let me give you a slightly different example. This is uh, from 2013. Um, and I wanted to make sure I gave you an example that wasn't just about drugs and it was a different type of exposure. So this Doe and colleagues here did a study where they were investigating the relationship between poverty, neighborhood level poverty and mortality risk. And they used a marginal structural approach. Now this is a panel survey, it's not uh, observational uh, administrative data or electronic medical records. And, and you can see in this schematic, what they have is they have the neighborhood level poverty at different time points, and they're trying to look at the income of uh, outcome of mortality. Um, and they also did a uh, comparison, comparing different approaches, and I'll show you those results in just a moment. But I just want to uh, show you this kind of pattern of things varying over time. And you can see their multi-step estimation process here. So first stage, they created an IPTW model for predicting the exposure, which in this case is neighborhood poverty. And their second stage, they looked at the relationship between neighborhood uh, the exposure here balanced on all the factors, uh, the confounders that are in the IPTW model on mortality. And they also included a lag effect here. And that makes sense given the question that they were asking. That, that doesn't necessarily have to be in every time you apply these approaches. So just high level looking at their approach, they have the naive model where they don't account for the time varying confounding and then the marginal structure model. They also did some stratified analysis for different ranges of poverty, um, zero to 20% versus 20 to 100%, which was explained in, and made sense conceptually in the rationale of their paper. But again, you see that kind of similar finding where you actually come up with quite different conclusions. Uh, using the marginal structural approach, accounting for time varying confounding, which you can think of in this case would be fairly important um, given um, how poverty, all the de determinants of poverty and how this could vary over time in neighborhoods, um, how accounting for that fact, you come up with quite a, a different conclusion that there is a, a significant risk of mortality uh, versus the naive approaches. And they state this in the paper very clearly that they feel that some, if you're using a conventional adjustment, you in fact are probably over adjusting for factors that are mediators and lie along, along the causal pathway. And they, that's included in their interpretation. Last one uh, I want to bring up uh, is an, an example of a marginal structural model approach uh, using machine learning generated weights. This is by uh, Bentley and colleagues. Um, and a very interesting study. And you can see again why a marginal structure approach might be useful here. So they were interested in investigating the effect of cumulative exposures to social housing and outcomes and social transition on mental health outcomes. Now, what did they do? They used a marginal structural model with inverse probability treatment weights. And the, the distinction here why this, I want to bring this example forward is that they used uh, machine learning uh, approaches to generate the weights using ensemble methods, which combine several machine learning models and try to find the best one. And so the fact that machine learning is being integrated into this approach here does not change anything. It doesn't change, uh, it, well, it does change things. I shouldn't say it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the principles of this multi-step estimation process where you generate weights, you have a sound causal framework, and then you, based on those weights, estimate an impact. The advantage of machine learning models potentially, and again, not in every case, is that you can really refine those weights. And the research shows that the better those weights are at predicting exposures uh, and the tighter they are at being uh, accounting for differences between exposed and unexposed, the, the uh, better it is in terms of not introducing bias, which makes sense. And when you have lots and lots of data and lots and lots of variables to put in and ensemble methods, which consider multiple data, then you might gain some advantages by using these methods. <laughs> 
I also want to refer you to a new paper by Balsar and Peterson, a really nice paper on the intersection between how machine learning methods are integrated into causal inference. And this is the idea, right? It's not changing the conceptual approach or what we're doing, but it is a tool that could help refine this weight process. Um, I should also mention today, uh, the Dalla School of Public Health is also hosting um, uh, a discussion on this led by uh, Professor Blakely and a panel on um, how you think about machine learning methods in causal inference, if there's of interest. So let's look at the picture again. So just uh, to reinforce when and why you would use these methods, you see you have a, a ex exposure of social housing that's changing over time. You have lots of uh, time variant confounders in this particular case. And had you just you know, adjusted for time invariant only or potentially adjusted for the time varying like their time invariant, there is a risk of bias that might be introduced either through uh, adjusting for something on the causal pathway or potentially a collider stratification bias. Last uh, thing I want to mention before I will uh, summarize, uh, I said at the beginning that sometimes marginal structural models are used in what's uh, a called a causal mediation analysis. Um, and a causal mediation analysis, when I say that, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the um, intention to look at direct and indirect effects through mediators. So perhaps you want to understand how much of exposure is mediated through a particular variable. And I'm not going to go through the whole process here, but I just wanted to tie the line um, if you are interested in these methods because um, they are related, right? So you would estimate the weights for the exposure, you'd estimate weights for the mediator, you have confounders for your exposure and your mediators. I just showed uh, lots of assumptions all along the way. Um, and I, if you're interested more, I encourage you to read Lang's uh, American Journal of Epi papers from 2012 and 2013, where he uh, explicitly walks through how you use marginal structural models to achieve these direct and indirect effects. Uh, there's code as well for that. So uh, I focus mostly on time varying confounding for causal questions, but if you're also interested in direct and indirect effects through mediators, these approaches can also be used. And for the same reasons, the fact that you can estimate uh, the weights at different points in time and for different uh, outcomes in this case, both for the uh, given the exposure and the mediator. Okay, um, how do you implement these methods? So lots and lots of resources. Um, if you're a Stata user, I do encourage you to read the like seminal article written by Faywell and all where they introduced these approaches uh, way back in 2004, uh, controlling for time varying confounding using marginal structural models, really nice introduction um, to the concept as well as links to the Stata um, code and it's been updated since then. So Stata can implement these methods fairly uh, easily. The Harvard program on causal inference has SAS and Stata macros on its website. Uh, in addition to IPDW approaches, they also provide resources for G estimation approaches and there's lots of packages in R, either using the IPW function um, and there's some other functions as well. So there's actually fairly good software and programs in all the packages uh, and macros to implement these methods. I would say this is not the most challenging part. The most challenging part is making sure you have a well-defined exposure, a good causal question, and the data to answer. That's the big challenge. And often when we're working with observational data, we don't have those things. I know that's been the case for me where I really wanted to implement some of these methods, but we just didn't have uh, the data to do so. So that's the bigger the bigger challenge. Okay, so a couple, uh, few, few things that I uh, didn't get a chance to cover in the time that we have together today, but I wanna mention them and just prime you to them if you're doing more thinking in this topic. So first of all, I talked a lot about weighting, creating the pseudo populations. I did not mention in detail that of course, once you wait, you can no longer just take uh, variance estimates or confidence intervals uh, based on that weighted population. Like any weighted sample, you have to account for that weighting, either using robust or sandwich variance estimators or bootstrapping. So it's an additional consideration for any of the 
uh, confidence intervals or uh, inferences that you want to make uh, based on the variance and p-values, you have to take that into account. Uh, I mentioned censoring weight, so I won't go over it again. Um, there, I, I, I mentioned this assumption about model misclassification um, as one of the key assumptions, but I want to just reinforce it again. If there is a problem there with your uh, IPTW bottle being misspecified, you'll not get all the benefits. So you can go through all the procedures and steps and, and execute beautifully, but if you have a model misspecification problem, you, there's still a risk of bias. And so just to keep that in mind when you are implementing these approaches. I mentioned a little bit about large weight stabilization and truncation. These are pretty standard approaches that you use with any IPTW approach. But I want to mention, I didn't cover it in detail, but that's something you'll need to consider. I think I've said assumptions enough times. And then lastly, just want to mention um, to create these weights, there are alternatives to IPDW, uh, parametric G formulas and G estimations, which I'm not going to go into. Also something known as sequential Cox models, which account for uh, how you can do these estimates over time. They are trying to achieve the same thing, that is the pseudo population where confounders are balanced over the exposure, but technically different ways to do so. Uh, and, and computationally more um, intensive, which is one of the reasons why IPTW approaches are a little more uh, popular. So uh, that is it for me. Um, I have my contact information there, but I'll just uh, end by saying uh, what I hope you took away from today. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast and overwhelm you, but uh, if if you took only a few things away, I hope it's these things. So first of all, that marginal structure models is a multi-step estimation procedure. So it's a procedure that separates confounder control from estimation and it produces marginal estimates compared to conditional estimates. And we covered IPTW approaches to do this. Important to note, as I just mentioned, there are other approaches to achieve that. And it's really needed and useful in longitudinal studies or studies where things are changing over time. And the reason why is because conventional estimate, regression-based estimates that don't account for time-varying confounders can produce bias. And we talked about a couple things in particular there with uh, over-adjustment bias and collider stratification. They help address these biases by providing a mechanism to do that. And the reason why we want to give this talk at this particular, with this particular audience is that things changing over time in longitudinal data is very common in uh, large population health linked health administrative data. And lastly, they do rely on strict assumptions and a sound conceptual basis. You need a strong causal model, a DAG, a well-formulated questions, ideally a target trial that you've thought of in your head before you even start. So I'm focusing on the uh, marginal structural model approach, but really you need that sort of end-to-end -end, uh, thinking through to have success with these approaches. So I'm gonna pause there. Uh, thank you for your attention and time and uh, very happy if there's any additional questions or clarifications that I can make. Thanks so much, so much, oh. Dr. Vizella, for your time today and presentation. Lots of excellent resources for everyone. I'm sure that uh, people will really appreciate having the time to look over uh, all of the papers you've mentioned and the uh, different equations as well. So thanks for all those excellent examples. I think I know they really help a lot. So the floor is open for questions. I also just want to mention while some questions are coming in, I have the references and resources up on the screen now. Uh, these are the important papers. I've bolded the seminal papers in this area by Robbins and Hernan. Um, so just to orient these. Great, thank you. So first question, can you please clarify the difference between IPTW in the propensity score methodology versus IPTW in the app? SMM methodology. I understand that they differ conceptually, but I'm struggling to see these differences methodologically. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, the main uh, difference is time. So in, in, IP, in a sort of regular IPTW approach, you think about that trial and you think about an exposure that's happened and we're using IPTW approaches to Set, create that counterfactual situation and estimate our outcome. The big extension here is that you take that thinking through at various time points. 
And so you would actually cre recreate weights at time one and time two and however many times throughout. And so it's no longer just, oh, a pseudopopulation. It's actually a pseudopopulation at different time points. And then you have to bring all that information back together for your final estimation. Um, so the time is the big difference here. And if you don't have anything, uh, a treatment or exposure that varies over time, you don't need these methods. So I hope that helps. I mean, it, it, um, sometimes the challenge is you can think, well, everything changes with time. I must need these all the time. But it really is reserved for those situations where those confounders really do change over time with the treatment, like the case of the antihypertensive and the blood pressure, where those are very important things to account for over time. Subtle changes over time, likely you won't see any large differences had you just done this as a time invariance analysis. Great, thank you. And Sarah says, yes, thank you for your, your answer. That does cover it. Um, Great. I, I don't see other another question at the moment. I'm just wondering, because you've provided so many excellent resources, and I don't know just my question off the top, I suppose, is um, if people were to choose, you know, the, the most important one foundationally, uh, which one do you think that they should start with or which few should they start with, I guess? Yeah, this is a really great question. So, um, I think it depends a little bit on your um, how technical you <laughs> you want this to be. I do think reading the Robbins paper that that introduces margin, you know, kind of seminal paper introducing marginal structure models and causal inference, uh, the Rosal Hernan and Brumbach paper is where I would definitely invite everyone. Even if you don't understand every equation or technical elements, I do find it's helpful to go through that first time it's really uh, presented in the literature. The other thing is the uh, Hernan and Robbins have a book on causal inference that's uh, available as an ebook on their website. And so that's another great resource. It's more of a textbook, like a description of these um, that I think uh, would be useful to most. And then I'll say the Masornia paper on time varying confounding is also one that I, I is extremely well written. It's not specifically about marginal structural models, but it's, I mean, obviously it talks about it, but it talks about handling time varying confounding and why that's important. It's, it's very helpful. So those are the three that I would um, start with. Great, thank you. And we have another question. Uh, you showed how to create weights for treatment versus non-treatment groups. How do you create weights when there are three groups? Yeah, really good question. So this is becoming uh, more and more common. And so I mentioned you could use uh, uh, logistic regression for say treated, no treated. And you can extend that idea and um, use something called a multinomial logistic regression. So a multinomial reg uh, logistic regression estimates multiple ca multi-category outcomes. And so you could take the weights from a model like that and extend it when you have uh, multiple exposures. And that's becoming more and more popular. Um, Peter Austin's also written something about the generalized propensity score, which adapts uh, the probability of treatment in lots of different situations. Um, so that would be another resource if you're, if you're going even beyond three categories or different types of exposures, not just exposed, unexposed. Great. Thanks so much again, Dr. Rosella, for your time and presenting today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to hearing more in the future. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for taking the time to attend. Thanks again. Bye for now. Take care.